Well, hey, biology. Hope you're doing well when you watch this, whether it be in the morning, in the afternoon, at like one o'clock in the morning. Some of y'all are saying that like really late. I'm hearing crazy stuff. I fall asleep by 9.30. It's the dad life. But nonetheless, today I'm going over 17.2, ideas that influence Charles Darwin. So here are your objectives. I want you to kind of um, when you're reading and doing the assignments, keep these objectives in mind. Identify the conclusions drawn by Hutton and Lyle about Earth's history to the two sciences I'm going to talk about here in a second. Describe Lamarck's hypothesis of evolution. I want you to be able to describe Malthus's view of population growth. We already talked about Malthus in ecology at the beginning of the year, but we'll refresh our memories. And then explain the role of inherited variation in artificial selection. So Darwin... We, you know, heard from our previous video in 17.1 that Darwin went on this voyage, but he's not alone on the voyage. He has all these thinkers with him in books, in his thoughts, from his memories. And so he's being influenced. We're all influenced by our teachers, by our parents or our family or, or people we listen to. And so do you want to be an influencer? for good is a good question to ask yourself, but these are some of the ideas that shaped Darwin. Hutton's view on geological change and Lyle's theories, Lamarck's view, Malthus's view, and then even artificial selection and some of Darwin's own uh, scientific practices also influenced him on his development of evolution. And so one of my bucket list items, and some of y'all have done it, which is amazing, and you should be so grateful and thankful, but I want to see the Grand Canyon. I want to see the Grand Canyon and the Redwoods keep driving west and go see the Redwoods, maybe go north and, and see Yellowstone, um, maybe some of the mountains in Washington. Vancouver right here is beautiful. You don't have to hear my bucket list story. That's not why you're here, but seriously, Grand Canyon's it. So if I were to ask you what do you see, most people would say beauty. Most people would say breathtaking. But some people would say they see millions and millions of years of formation, and some others would say they don't see that. They see thousands of years of development. Again, Christians are on both sides. But at the time of Darwin, most people believed that the earth was uh, young. And both James Hutton and Charles Lyell kind of challenged that, questioned that. They came up with uniformitarianism. That's a fun word to say. Um, it's been taught, you know, shortly after the word geology was cor uh, coined. Although catastrophism geology is alive and well, currently the word geology connotes or means uniformitarianism. So what exactly is the difference between uniformitarianism and catastrophism? Uniformitarianism is the belief that the processes that we see today, you know, the rates of water, of radiation, of movement of the continents, all these different rates that we see, have been consistent throughout Earth's history. It's been around for billions of years. Now, catastrophism is the rates have changed. And some Christians would argue the rates changed during creation, possibly, possibly during the flood when the deeps were broken up. Maybe that also influenced the rate, but that's not a discussion for now, just something to help you you know, maybe think about or go research if you if you like. But Darwin asked himself, so all these thoughts are out there, and Lyle and Hutton are, are claiming that the earth is old. These processes have been around for a long time. And Darwin asked himself, if earth can change over time, well, what about life? Can life also change over time? This is a picture from your textbook. You can see that Darwin was influenced by, sorry, that is like off the screen a little bit. So let me, you know, move that. Well, it's okay. Processes that shape Earth. So James Hunt described how geological processes could form and transform rocks and twist them. You can see over here on this surface right here. Rocks in this formation were folded and twisted by intense pressure. Water and wind tear down, break down rocks over time. Molten lava can build land masses like the famous island of Circe. Um, so, yeah, Darwin's, you know, thinking about all these thoughts on his voyage. I mean, Darwin, you read about in your book, but Darwin experienced earthquakes and volcanoes and saw fossils. And, and he's experiencing the earth changing. And he's like, well, if all this could happen over a long period of time, earthquakes could form mountains and, you know, volcanoes could form land masses. And so this is kind of what he's thinking about as he's traveling around on his five-year 
voyage on the HMS Beagle. And so Hutton declared that the Earth is millions of years old. Lyle said that whatever happened in the past, they're still happening now at the same rate. Not only that, Darwin was not the first person to think that life changes. There was a man named John Baptiste Lamarck. I might have mispronounced that, but I tried my best to. John Baptiste Lamarck. Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds right. Living things have changed over time. He, he claimed that living things respond to their environment. So this is where it differs. You need to know about Lamarck. He argued that through either use or disuse, organisms acquired or lost certain traits. And whatever they acquired or lost was passed on to their offspring. And so I have a kind of like a funny you know, illustration of this. But let's say, you know, this is from a workout ad. But let's say, I don't have no idea what this guy's name is. No, no idea. Uh, Rick. That's a, that's a good name. No, I don't know. Anyways. You can see, let's say you're, you know, you know, look like this, and then you work out really hard, like pumping iron, like what's up, what's up, and then like curling. I've been trying to work out at home because, like, you know, cabin fever, it's uh, it's real, and trying to trying to do that. But let's say that you know you work out, take everything legally, which is debatable in this picture, but nonetheless, and you get super strong, and I mean like benching over 400, squatting, you know, 600. I mean, you're like crazy strong. Would you pass that strength on to your offspring? What if you developed diabetes or heart disease? Does that automatically mean that your offspring would have those diseases? What if you bruised your left arm or, and, and you know, your left arm got really weak because you didn't use it very much, would your offspring have a weaker left arm. Well, most of you are probably saying like, well, no, that's, that, that's not exactly how it happens. And so this is a very good illustration. I'll take the webcam away here so you can see it, but walk through this, but this is, um, and it might be a little blurry, but Lamarck's view is giraffes got those long necks because they kept stretching and stretching and stretching for the leaves. Darwin and Wallace's view, you learn about Wallace when you watch that video that I assigned, is that it variation just naturally happened, and the the giraffe that had the longer neck, just due to random chance, had a higher fitness level, which means able to survive and reproduce and pass along that successful genes or genes probably that made that longer neck. And so Lamarck argued, the more you use something, the higher the likelihood is that'll be passed on to the next generation. And so this is called Lamarckism. Inheritance. Inheritance of acquired characteristics. Acquired means you get it you throughout your lifetime. You acquire it. You know, like I acquire a new car. You acquire these characteristics, and then your offspring are given them. Okay, Lamarck. There's a funny little comic here. Stretch, stretch. Think about the children. <laughs> oh, man. It's, you know, you probably didn't laugh. But would Lamarck's view on evolution be a hypothesis or a theory? And hopefully you're realizing by now that theories are backed by lots of scientific evidence. Um, it can't be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's why it's a theory. So Lamarck's view would be a hypothesis. And it was, you know, a creative hypothesis. But of course, we know it not to be true today. Not only did those guys influence Darwin, a man named Thomas Malthus did as well. We already talked about him in ecology, but briefly, he was an economist who introduced the concept of human population growth and the problem of too many people. He saw the world around him and he saw how hunger and war kept the human population in check. He did not account for, of course, remember ecology. What did he not account for? He didn't account for the Industrial Revolution, right? All the food and the sanitation and the medicine that came from that. But Darwin was wondering, why do some survive and why do some die? I mean, if that worked for the human population, wouldn't it work for the organisms around the world as well? And so this is just kind of a little graphic here. But as you can see, this is what Malthus would say, like you start low and then all of a sudden, you know, everything's going well and you overshoot your supplies. And then eventually, this is where the population would reach its limit and either war, famine, or disease would cause the population to go down. And so ideas that shape Darwin's thinking, 
Many of Darwin's observations of variation and selection came from domesticated plants and animals. Darwin actually bred pigeons and recognized similarities between selection by breeders and selection in nature. So in both cases, selection simply increases the frequency of a trait. Our official selection is when humans select them. We've been doing this, humans that is, for thousands and thousands of years. For example, these are Darwin's um, pigeons. You know, in, in one case, this is from a, another textbook that I have, but these are all versions that were artificially selected based upon certain traits that the breeders were wanting from the rock pigeon right here. This is variations directly from the rock pigeon. I don't know if you like corn. Um, had some like sweet canned corn the other day. I don't, I don't know if it was, I, it wasn't very good, but roasted corn, grilled corn. Oh man, grilled corn is amazing. But anyways, Tio Sente, hopefully I said that right. That was the ancestor of the corn that we know today. How do we get the corn we have today? Through artificial selection, breeders were selecting every generation more, um, like, you know, larger kernels, more, you know, starchy kernels. You can see here, I don't know if you like vegetables, I encourage you to eat them super healthy and important for your body, but broccoli and cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, kohlrabi, they all come from, came from a wild mustard plant. And so this is artificial selection. And so this is what you'll be reading in 17.2. All these ideas influence Darwin's thinking. So a quick check here. Lamarck's ideas about evolution were wrong because he proposed that species change over time, species descended from other species, acquired characteristics can be inherited, species are adapted to their environments. I'll let you have a moment to think. If I was cool, I would insert Jeopardy music here, but I don't know how to do that, and I don't probably have the time. But nonetheless, the answer is C. Acquired characteristics can be inherited. Another question. Lyle influence Darwin because he explained how organisms change over time, adaptations occur, the surface of Earth changes over time, the Galapagos Islands formed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I won't do that. The answer is C, surface of Earth changes over time. And finally, a farmer's use of the best livestock for breeding is an example of natural selection, artificial selection, extinction, or adaptation and if a farmer is choosing the best livestock, maybe the most milk or the largest ones to breed and create offspring is artificial selection. So um, these are the questions in your book. Remember, your, all these questions are due this week in Chapter 17, and I'll be going over specifically more along that. Um, I also would prepare. I'll send an email out, but I'll prepare for vocabulary quiz coming up on all the terms in chapter 17. So until then, if you have any questions, guys, please let me know. And I hope you're doing well. I'll talk to you later. God bless.